For 27 years, Mao Zedong cast a giant shadow over China. When he died in 1976, there was general grief. No one, not even the Chinese themselves, had any real idea what was going to happen. There was a feeling of unease. A few weeks earlier, a terrible earthquake had struck eastern China and a quarter of a million people had been killed. The peasants said it was an omen. The old order would be swept away and say what was taking place. Back in April, when I was very ill, the riots in central Peking itself was the police had removed the invaded the to join Lai. Thousands demonstrated against Mao's most extreme followers, the so-called Gang Four. The leader of this radical group was Mao Zedong Chang Jin. She was an ambitious, calculating woman, but not without courage. She hoped to succeed Mao and to continue and intensify his revolutionary policies. The man who was made the scapegoat for the riots in Peking was her great enemy, Deng Xiaoping. He wanted less revolution and more realism. Common sense policies to raise the living standards of China's one billion people and make the country prosperous and strong. His most quoted saying was, it doesn't matter if the cat is black or white, so long as it catches the mice. In other words, good policies are the ones that work. Eventually, as we shall see, Deng's ideas would triumph in China, and five years later he would emerge as the country's undisputed leader. But back in 1976, the Gang of Four said he wanted to bring back capitalism, and he was sacked. In his place, a much less well-known figure, Hua Guofeng was designated heir apparent as a compromise between the radicals and those who secretly sympathised with Deng's reformist line. The result of all this was that when Mao died on September the 9th, 1976, China faced a choice of any one of three possible ways forward. First, Jiang Qing's way, that is the way of the Gang of Four, extreme left-wing egalitarianism and permanent revolution. Second, Deng Xiaoping's way, modernization, higher living standards and greater contact with the outside world. Third, Hua Guofeng's way, midway between the other two, continuing Mao's revolutionary policies, but allowing some modernization as well. The story of China after Mao has very largely been the story of the struggle between the three different sets of ideas that these three people represented. At first, Hua came out on top. He was appointed chairman of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China, and four weeks later, with the support of key Chinese army leaders, he ordered the Gang of Four, Yao Wenyuan, Wang Hongwen, Chang Chun Chao, and Chang Qing to be arrested. They were accused of trying to seize power and a huge campaign was launched to discredit them and to blame them for all the things that had gone wrong during the last years of Mao's life. Cartoonists savagely mocked them. But people soon started asking, if the gang of four were so bad, why didn't Mao do anything to stop them? And from there it was a short step to asking whether Mao himself had not sometimes been wrong and whether China should go on sticking to his ideas. Hua, appointed by Mao, tried to avoid that question. If Mao were now shown to have made mistakes, Hua's own position would be undermined. However, too many people had suffered in China at the hands of the Gang of Four for the question simply to go away. And after Deng Xiaoping was reinstated in August 1977, the truth about Mao's last years and the terror that reigned in China during his Cultural Revolution began to come out.
trial of the Gang of Four began in the winter of 1980. Although they were not the only ones on trial, it was Madame Mao, Zhang Jing, and her three colleagues who attracted the most attention. There were 35 lawyers, all dressed in grey, and the trial was presided over by a sleek, round-faced judge in black. The Gang of Four were accused of persecuting hundreds of thousands of people during the upheavals of the Cultural Revolution. All the time, according to the carefully edited official film released by the Chinese government, Madame Mao remained defiant. For example, she interrupted an elderly witness who was tearfully telling how he'd been tortured during the Cultural Revolution. When the judge ordered her to be silent, she refused. You're calling in traitors and bad elements to give evidence, she said. When more warnings had failed to silence her, she was forcibly removed. After three months, the court pronounced sentence. The unrepentant Chiang Qing and Chiang Chun Chao were sentenced to death with a two-year reprieve. The others were imprisoned. But perhaps the most important thing about this trial was that it marked the final rejection of Mao's policies. Hua was accused of having tried to obstruct the emergence of these truths, and in the summer of 1981 he was replaced as party chairman by Hu Yaobang, a protégé of Deng's. So, after five years of often bitter struggle, the gang of four were in prison, serving long sentences, Hua was on the way out, and Deng had emerged triumphant. His is the face of China today. And what does that face look like? Deng wanted to release the energy and enterprise of the Chinese people by giving them more freedom. Of course, that freedom had its limits. As a communist, Deng believed in a one-party system in which the working class exercised dictatorship over its enemies. The democratic traditions which had developed over hundreds of years in Europe were very largely absent. Only 80 years ago, China was still ruled by a feudal emperor. This was shown dramatically during the peaking spring. When last 1978 and early 1979, young people began putting up wall posters, challenging the order of things. Deng had to in his struggle against Hua Guofeng. But as soon as it began to threaten the power of the party, Deng ordered it closed down. Nonetheless, in politically safer ways, greater freedom of expression was allowed, and the lives of the Chinese people were generally changed out of all recognition. For example, Western music was publicly played. Historic opera and ballet restored after being banned by Madame Mao. and the fashion-conscious young were once again allowed to dance together. Hey, me and attend pop concerts. So leave me on the yo -yo. Wake me up before you go, go. I don't want to miss the same principle, greater freedom, more scope for individual enterprise, was applied to the economy. But here, Deng introduced another major change. Whereas Mao had wanted people to work selflessly for communist ideals, without thinking about material rewards, Deng recognized that people would only work well if they were given a practical incentive, more money, and a better life for themselves and their families. So, instead of having to farm collectively, each peasant family was given an area to farm on its own. Mao's communes, once hailed as a giant stride towards communism, were quietly disbanded. 
peasant markets, which Mao had closed, were allowed to reopen. Under the old system, everyone earned the same amount, whether they worked or not. So most people did as little as they could. As a result, everyone was poor. Under the new system, each family was paid by results. Those who worked hard and who were lucky enough to have been given good land could become rich and live comfortably. Those who lived in areas of poor land or had no work remained poor, often desperately poor. This led to inequalities between the poor and the rich, not unlike those in non-communist countries, which must have made Mao turn in his grave. But the policy worked. Grain production in China rocketed as never before. For the first time in 30 years, food rationing was abolished. Here too, however, freedom had a limit. For Deng and his colleagues realized that if China was to prosper, the growth of the population had to be held down. Otherwise, all the extra grain being produced by the new policies would simply go to feed extra mouths and not to create new wealth. And if the population carried on growing at the rate it did in Mao's time, very soon there wouldn't be enough land available to support it. That would lead to renewed food shortages and in the end starvation. So a big campaign began telling the Chinese they could only have one child, have one child and modernize. But the peasants wanted many children to provide extra hands to help work the land now that each family was paid by results. To this there was no easy answer. Whatever else happens in China, population problems will continue to dominate any discussion of the future for decades to come. As in agriculture, so in commerce and industry, the same mixture of more freedom and more incentives was brought to bear. For the first time since the 1950s, private shops and restaurants were allowed to reopen. Traditional skills were once again encouraged. Private workshops started up. State-owned factories were encouraged to make profits, which under Mao had been denounced as exploiting the people. Workers were given productivity bonuses and those who refused to work were liable to be sacked. Under Mao, if a factory did make profits, it had to surrender them all to the state, and if it made losses, the state would bail it out. Deng introduced a system of corporate taxation instead, so that factories that did well were allowed to keep some of the benefits. Was Deng really introducing capitalism, as the gang of four had claimed? and as these advertisements might suggest? No, because the means of production, the land and the factories remained the property of the community, not of individuals. What Deng had done was to introduce many of the methods used in capitalist countries in order to make the communist system more efficient. Deng applied the same principle to the People's Liberation Army, which Mao had made into a political force whose main task was to spread his revolutionary ideas. Deng wanted less politics and a smaller, more professional army. They were given new uniforms, and plans were announced to restore badges of rank, which Mao had abolished in the interests of equality. But many older officers were shocked by Deng's efforts to turn Mao's communist guerrillas into a modern fighting force. And the army, supported by some party officials, remained a key source of opposition to Deng's reforms in all fields. The effect of these changes that followed Mao's death can't be overstated. After 20 years of glorification of Mao's ideas, they marked an admission that those ideas had failed. The new start made under Deng changed the daily lives of one in four of the world's population. 
It also had a profound effect on China's foreign policy. Mao believed that a new world war was inevitable, that it would destroy capitalism and the revolution would triumph. Deng believed that progress would be made not through revolution, but through hard work and modernization, and for that a long period of peace would be needed. The only major power with which China has a long land border is the Soviet Union. In the late 1960s, they were close to war. Later, the Chinese tried to reduce tension and thereby remove the risk of war by starting talks with the Russians. But the main thrust of Deng's policy was to expand dramatically China's relations with Western nations and with Japan, the country is best able to provide the expertise and the money needed to help China modernize. Mao's policy of self-reliance was quietly abandoned and in every field China began to aim for a greater role in the world. Their athletes took part in the 1984 Olympic Games for the first time in 30 years. And as one of the five world nuclear powers, China began to attend disarmament negotiations and joined the World Bank and the IMF. And in the spring of 1979, Deng paid an historic visit to America to meet President Carter. A steady stream of Western leaders traveled to Peking. Among them, President Reagan and Mrs. Thatcher. She had a special problem to discuss. Hong Kong. This capitalist island on China's southern coast had been under British rule since 1843. A century later, it had developed one of the most dynamic economies in Asia. But the lease under which Britain held the greater part of the territory would end in 1997. In order to keep business confidence, Britain and China had to agree on what would happen after that date. Under Mao, this would have been difficult, perhaps impossible. Life on the two sides of the border was simply too different. But Deng believed that Hong Kong had a lot to teach the new China coming into being under his leadership and he'd already started setting up special economic zones where foreign businessmen could build factories on favorable terms. Not too different from those that Hong Kong itself offered. In 1984, Deng and Mrs. Thatcher signed an accord whereby British rule would end in 1997 and Hong Kong would become a special administrative district of China but with guarantees to the territory's people that the capitalist system would continue for at least another 50 years. The circumstances are unique. The agreement is unique. It is right that we should feel a sense of history, of pride, and of confidence in the future. May I thank you for the privilege of being at this time in Deng hoped it would be the model for an eventual coming together of China and nationalist ruled Taiwan. But whether or not that does happen, the fact that such an agreement could be reached over Hong Kong offered dramatic evidence of the practicality and flexibility of China's new rulers. <laughs> Jiang Lai Hui Zi Ya